here. Okay. So welcome to week five of Step Up into Life After High School. We'll be talking about um, the Medicaid waiver programs, home community-based waivers here in the state of Colorado. Um, so it's very specific to Colorado this evening. We'll step right into it. I'll go ahead and get us rolling. There we go. Let's see. Um, so what we'll talk about tonight, um, some eligibility for the adult waiver programs. We'll compare and contrast the waivers available here in the state of Colorado. Um, we'll go over the application and some barriers that, um, to accessing services. We'll talk about the funding for each service and then we'll, um, we'll talk about the wait lists um, for one of the adult waivers here in the state of Colorado. Um, it's just me tonight, so no, no extra host. So we'll jump right in. So uh, we call them home and community-based Medicaid waivers or HCBS, as you'll see um, it often called. Um, these programs are a public program that provides additional supports for those that receive Medicaid benefits. Um, you have to meet those specific extras to um, to uh, you know again qualify for a waiver. So we're going to go through the idea of you know you apply for Social Security and or Medicaid, um, and so you're approved for one of both of those. Once you're on Medicaid, um, then we can look at if you qualify for a waiver. So remember that analogy of last week. Social Security gets you the neighborhood barbecue, Medicaid gets you inside the house, and then waivers get you down to the game room with the you know the fun food and and more you know entertainment down there. Uh, currently, all Medicaid waivers, except for one, are open enrollment, meaning if your son or daughter qualifies, um, they can get you enrolled. Um, there's one, we'll talk about that, why it has a wait list. Um, there's a certain way you get into these waivers, um, and each one is a little different. For the intellectual and developmental disabilities waivers, uh, we go through what we call community center boards. Um, and they, you know, geographically, there's 20 of them around the state of Colorado, and they are essentially the gatekeepers for Medicaid, um, the waiver-based program. So you get on Medicaid, then they, you make sure with all the paperwork, um, what you can get into services. Um, home community-based service waivers are, you know, again, we went to the federal government for that Medicaid and said we need you to waive this all or none rule so we can have, you know, our special population gets more supports than the general population on Medicaid. Uh, the disability part is really the, the big key for the adult waivers. For any of you that are currently on um, the CES, the Children's um, Extensive Services Waiver, or the Children's HCBS, Home and Community Based Services Waiver, uh, or if anyone's on the EBD waiver currently, there might be some of you, know, you that are, are your, your loved ones already over the 18 on the EBD waiver. Uh, the rules are a little bit different for the adults waivers. For kids waivers, you have to prove you're the most in need. You have to prove that your son or daughter has the most, you know, they're not sleeping through the night. They have a lot of behaviors going on. They have a lot of medical issues. The adult system is a, lot, a little bit more simple than that. We just have to prove the disability. Um, and then we'll go from there. Then they're kind of put into some buckets for the, you know, how severe that disability might, may or may not be. Um, so again, like we talked last week, Medicaid's like a house. We're trying to get you in that house, um, be it get you in for through the front door, the back door, the, the you know, wherever that might be, we're trying to get you in that house. So if it's the buy-in program with your young adult um, because they're working, that's great. That doesn't mean they can't, they don't qualify for a, the waiver programs. We just got to get you in Medicaid. So once we have Medicaid, we can then take the next step. And remember, this was the slide for, again from last week that shows the two sides of Medicaid. So again, remembering the analogy, Medicaid's like a big umbrella and that this Health First Colorado, which is Medicaid, there's a pole that runs down the middle of this. And there's the state benefit side over here to the left, doctors, specialists, 
you know, behavior therapy, all that stuff for, you know, kids and adults, um, dentistry, this is all on the Medicaid side. That's what you get if you just have straight Medicaid. We're then going to work with you all once you have Medicaid to see if you qualify for the waiver side, which is the side over here on the right, the stop sign and hexagon um, side. The blue stop signs are the adult waivers. Um, so specifically, there are two that are only for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, um, which is the Sport Living Services Waiver and then what we call the Home and Community-Based Developmental Dis Disabilities Waiver or the DD Waiver or the Adult Waiver or the Comp Waiver. Um, we like to call it a bunch of different names, but we'll dive into those here in just a few moments. How do you get on a waiver? Well, we got to get you to what we call a single entry point or a SEP. Um, single entry points are essentially non-government entities that have been awarded the contract to um, do the paperwork to get people into services. So here's a list of all, um, I always for, I forget to add the new waiver. There's a spinal injury, spinal injury cord waiver spinal cord injury waiver that I forget I forget to add to this every year because it's not one we deal with often but the the first four are children's waivers so under the age of 18 um, the children's HGBS waiver I mean it's technically not necessarily a waiver but it does have supports in there for kiddos that need a little more help um, the CES waiver that is the, the waiver specific to kiddos with disabilities intellectual and developmental disabilities Children with life limiting illness, uh, one of the status waivers out there. It's really meant for kiddos that aren't really expected to live, you know, very long and, you know, sadly. Um, a lot of bereavement services in that. And then there's the CHIRP waiver, our Children's Habilitative Residential Program waiver, or CHIRP, which is much easier to say. Um, this is a, a waiver that is, um, was originally for foster care kids. Um, kids that were removed from the home or for whatever reason. Now it's a waiver built for any child, even kids with disabilities that might need support and that's at risk of being, you know, taken from the home. It doesn't mean that they're your bad parent or that, the, you know, for, it means there's just maybe too many behaviors, the kid is really having a hard time and they, they need, you need a little more support and maybe having the kid be like, place somewhere short term to get medication management, to get some wraparound services in place, and then coming back to the family unit might be more beneficial. So it's essentially what, uh, now it's a way that we can help kiddos that don't fall into that um, foster care system, but really are tough for their parents to support. Um, then you step into the adult waivers. So the brain injury waiver, um, pretty straightforward. The um, elderly blind and disabled waiver, um, or we call the EBD. Um, that waiver does serve people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. That's the disabled part. Um, I kind of rank the, the three waivers like this, the elderly, blind, and disabled. It's like the bronze package. There's great services in there. There's a lot of support in there. Um, a lot of things relating to um, some med uh, more medical supports. Um, this is where kind of hospice lives uh, for some of our individuals on Medicaid. So, um, and there's a lot more maybe nursing support, uh, medical that level of care skilled care in the EBD waiver. Um, bronze is a great package. It, it works really well. And there's some families that live on that package for years. Then you step into the supported living services waiver or the SLS waiver. Um, that would be like the silver package. Uh, it is built for specifically for adults with intellectual developmental disabilities. They're able to live on that semi-independently. They might be living with their family member, their loved one. They might be living with friends or, or roommates. They might be living on their own. Um, and that's what the support living services waiver is. And we'll dive into that deeper here in a moment. Um, but there are people that have lived on the SLS waiver for you know, 20, 25 years and, and, and thrived on it. Then there's the persons with developmental disabilities or the DD comp waiver, um, because it's comprehensive. It covers um, someone to help with that, with those residential supervision and supports. Um, that would be the gold package. And really it's because of that residential piece in it. Again, it doesn't pay for room and board. Everyone has to pay for that themselves. Um, that's why for the disability, the DD waiver, the comp waiver, you have to have SSI or other means to pay for room and board. Um, so that's why it's the gold package. We'll get into that in a little bit. There's the mental health waiver. Um, 
which is exactly what it sounds like. There is some residential supports within the mental health waiver, um, but the mental health waiver is built for, you know, people that have true harsh mental health issues going on. Um, and then there's the spinal injury, spinal cord injury waiver, um, again, for adults. Um, so single entry point provides case management. They do care plans. They make referrals out to other agencies like Medicaid for their members. For people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, our single entry points have a specific name and we call them community center boards or CCBs as we like to use acronyms here. The community center board does this. It does not provide any direct care. They do not find people jobs. They do not run day programs. They do not, you know, bathe, shower, toilet, dress your loved one. They do paperwork. Their job is to do intake and eligibility to make sure your loved one qualifies for services. They meet the definitions. They do service plan development. So they write up a plan. Um, they arrange for services and how they're going to be managed. The, the analogy I use here is your case manager at a community center board is kind of like a stockbroker. They're moving money from Medicaid, from the waiver programs, into accounts for Luke Wheeland Agency. So I run, let's say I run a day program. I can then bill against that account because my name's on it for supporting your loved one in a day program. Or Luke Wheeland Agency support employment. So I go out and help them at their, you know, at their job every day or at once a week or once a month, depending on their level of need, I can bill for that time I'm spending with them because that case manager has moved money from their main account over here in the waiver to an account for support employment for Luke Wheeland Agency. Um, so your case manager at, at say like developmental pathways or DDRC for Jefferson County, Rocky Mountain Human Services for the Denver Metro area County, um, Imagine up north, uh, I mean, blue sky out on the eastern plains, you know, there's 20 of them here. Um, they don't ever actually touch your money. Developmental Pathways doesn't keep it. If you, don't, if you use it or if you don't use it all, DP doesn't get to keep that money. The community center boards have nothing to do with it. All they're doing is like a stockbroker, moving it from one spot to another and writing up why your loved one needs it. Um, they do a lot of monitoring and safeguards. So this is part of that um, conversation we talked about at the beginning, that the system is built to keep your loved ones healthy and safe. Um, doesn't mean they're not gonna be taken advantage of. It doesn't mean that people aren't gonna be mean, to, you know, always nice to them. It doesn't mean that people might not be mean to them. It means that the system have safeguards and keep them safe. Things like mandatory reporting laws, um, looking at why that you know what rules and regs are and that everyone that serves your loved one has to follow the same rules and regs so if you're a paid provider which we'll talk about you can't that could be an option for some of you you have to be follow all the same rules as someone else like if i was being paid to provide supports to your loved one they do terminations and discharges from services so if someone passes away moves out of state or just decides they don't want services that is the right of an adult um, disability or not, they can decide they don't want to be in, in services. Um, so what they're doing is case management. That's all case management. Your case manager, so at, at Developmental Pathways or Rocky Mountain Human Services or North Metro, wherever it might be, whatever community center board, um, does this. So they do assessments for your long-term care needs. So essentially they figure out your loved one's level of supports. Can they bathe themselves? Can they eat? And they, are they able to walk on their own? What's their toileting issue, you know, supports needs? Um, they do an assessment called the support intensity scale that um, we call the SIS, S-I-S, uh, which is essentially how we get funding levels for individuals. They do uh, monitoring. So they come out and visit your loved one where they live, where they go to, where they work, where they go to, you know, if they go to a day program, you know, anything of the billable service, their case manager is going to come out and visit to kind of check in. How are things going? They might call and talk to a behavioral provider um, and, and ask how things are. Um, they evaluate the effectiveness of services and can do reassessments of those services. So it's not like you talk to your case manager in, you know, the first of your service plan year and we moved all the money. They did all their stockbroking stuff into their that bank account over here for all these individual people and it's stuck there for a year. Nope, they can go in and rearrange 
how that money is placed and where and we call that money units, where those money that money and units are moved to and all those different aspects. That's what a case manager does. They're not there to find them a job. They're gonna find them agencies that they're gonna give you options and we'll go over that um, in, a, in a week what, to how they find you a job, or find you providers. Um, they find you different agencies that can help your son or daughter that you, then you all get to pick from. So they give you like a list or a plethora of agencies that provide certain services, but they're never gonna be the ones out there finding them a job. They're not gonna be the ones out there helping you fill out Medicaid applications. Um, can they help you fill out a HUD voucher? Yes, they definitely can. Can they help you fill out, um, you know, look up some things for to file your appeal? Sure they can, if they're not brand new and they can and they know what they're, they're doing. Um, can they, you know, hold on one moment, sorry, my neighbor's pounding on something. Can they, you know, help your loved one, you know, find a new program they want to attend or maybe look into some ways to spend, you know, spend their service plan monies down? Sure they can. Um, the idea of a case manager is also to be there to be a, um, an advocate for your loved one. So they should be, you know, really supporting them and finding out what's best for their own life. Real quick, so that's how we get into services. So again, we go through a single entry point for our loved ones. If we're looking at the SLS or DD waiver or if one of the child with the CES waiver, we're gonna go through the single entry point of the community center board. If you're looking at them as an adult um, or through that EBD waiver or something else, then we're gonna go through a different single entry point depending on where you live in the state of Colorado. Are there any questions currently on the community center board and what a case manager does? Either feel free to unmute yourself or you can throw it in the chat box. Luke, I have a question. Sure. How much does a case manager help um, transition into adult waivers? Well, the community center board is going to help you by when you call the intake line for whatever community center board you're with, they should start by reaching out and asking for a handful of paperwork. Same paperwork Medicaid wanted, same paperwork Social Security wants, same stuff that Amy Heller kind of talked about. They're going to start looking to see if your loved one qualifies. Once they figure out if they qualify, then they're going to give you a list of any waiver that your loved one would actually qualify for. Um, typically, if you're already going to a to the community center board, they're looking. They're probably only getting. They're going to give you the SLS waiver as the option because the DD waiver has a wait list. Um, if you're going through a single entry point, um, they might offer you the EBD waiver or the contact information to reach out to your your local community center board. Um, for here in the metro area, so Adams, Arapahoe, Douglas, Elbert, and Denver County. Uh, our community center board, uh, our, our single entry point for all the waivers that are not IDD specific, so that aren't the CES for kiddos, SLS, and DD, is also a community center board. It's Rocky Mountain Human Services. They just were awarded that contract. So they, if you go to Rocky Mountain Human Services, they are going to look at the paperwork for your loved one, determine what waivers they qualify for, and actually probably offer you any waiver that they're qualified for. Um, the trick is you have to apply your single entry point or community center board if it's just for the DD waiver that it is in your county of residence because that's the Medicaid. They use it where your, your Medicaid's attached. Um, you have to get in that single entry point with, with your county of residence. Then you can choose to go to a different community center board if you would like. So if you live in Adams County, North Metro is your community center board. Once you're in North Metro, once they've done the intake and got you into services, you then, your loved one has the right to choose, well, I wanna use DDRC, or I wanna use Blue Sky. Um, as long as that CCB, that community center board is willing to take your loved one, then they'll serve them. Blue Sky is not gonna come into the metro area. It's pretty much for like the Lyman to Kansas border. Um, but 
DDRC might, depending on where you live in Adams County, you might be on that border close to them. They serve, they don't, you know, case managers right now can work anywhere because we're all of us are remote, but even before COVID they can, you know, drive. Developmental Pathways I know serves individuals um, living in Fort Collins and they have individuals that live in Colorado Springs because they've optioned into their waiver, into their community center board and DP's taken them. Rocky Mountain has the same. They serve people from in a pretty wide area of the metro area, not just within the Denver County, because people have gone to them and asked. Um, for anyone living outside the metro area, that might be a lot harder ask. Um, Mesa counties, CCB might serve Delta, because you know Junction and Delta are relatively close, but they're not gonna go to Durango. Um, you know, the, the one that serves the Central Mountain, um, Eagle, Aspen, Vale kind of area, um, they're not going to, you know, DP is not going to take someone up there because they're not going to send a case manager up to, you know, to veil in the middle of the winter. So they just know they can't do those. Um, but they, once you've done the intake, once you've given them information, you make that initial call, the community center boards are working closely with you. Um, and normally as fast, realistically, as you are working with them. There sometimes are some funnel problems, that there's too many people and not enough case managers to process intakes. Um, but for the most part, the CCBs do a pretty decent job of getting people into services once you're connected to them. The trick is you gotta know to be connected to them. And it's not something every parent's told or every teacher understands or you know that you need to be in contact with this random agency because your son or daughter has an intellectual or developmental disability. Any other, does that help? Yes, thank you. Um, again, and like I said, at the, you know, the first class, the community center boards want your loved ones and services. If it wasn't for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, developmental pathways wouldn't exist. Rocky Mountain Human Services wouldn't exist. Um, they want your loved ones and services. So they're doing everything they can to get them in services um, sometimes it might come off that they don't want us or we're not, you know, it's, it's not that way at all. Um, developmental pathway serves over 2,500 adults. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts. Uh, so they're processing through and if they're not getting a response from you, they're going to kind of put you into a queue like you would hear on zoom in a waiting room and wait for you to respond, um, before they're going to reach out again. Um, the department, you know, the Department of Healthcare Policy and Finance, or HICPUF, the state, wants your loved ones and services. Um, you know, the people up there work really hard, and you know, they have to follow the rules too. So sometimes it doesn't seem like they, you know, it, it always comes off that way. And the you know, money does definitely does play a lot into how services look. But in the you know end of the day, they want your loved ones and services because they know that's the support they need. I'm going to keep rolling. If you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or throw it in the chat box and I can jump into that. So we'll step right into the adult waivers. Um, so we're going to compare and, and contrast the, the waivers. Um, we'll start with the SLS waiver, Supported Living Services waiver. This waiver is you know, provided for home and community based persons to live in their community with, that have disabilities. Uh, Pretty simple, it's the open enrollment waiver. There is no wait list for this waiver. Uh, here's the criteria. So they have to be over 18, check. Um, they have to be able to live independently. And now that you know, doesn't mean they have to go live on their own. Um, and it doesn't mean they can't have extensive supports. Um, they just need to be able to have, have some level of, of self-care in, in terms of they're doing some things for themselves. There are individuals that are nonverbal, non-mobile, that are in the SLS waiver. Um, there and they and they live there and they do they do well. Um, it doesn't so that level of independence is, is a very kind of loose term there. Um, the third bullet point is a historic term that we have to uh, um, keep in there. It's written because it's by the federal government that your loved one has to be at risk for being institutionalized. Um, the state of Colorado doesn't run institutions any longer. Um, that's what 
what home and community-based services are for, is instead of putting people in, a, in an institution away from society, we want them to be in their home and in their community getting the supports they need. But they do have to still follow that risk. Um, for most of you, I'd say, you know, I can't guarantee it, but all of your loved ones, if they qualify for Medicaid because of their intellectual and developmental disabilities, should qualify for that SLS waiver, more than likely. Again, the ARCs aren't the ones that do the intake and eligibility, but more often than not, you should qualify for that because of their um, they're meeting all the criteria already for Medicaid or Social Security or both from that. Um, the other ones, the you know income, they can't make more than 300 percent. Um, that's three times, and I still use the you know 2016 because it hasn't gone up. So um, that's the you know 300 percent more than the you know what the state considers or the federal government considers the poverty line. Each state gets to do that percentage on their own. Um, so essentially they have to have that less than two thousand dollars in assets um that wiggle room there up and down for what that looks like but that's our asset limit so they have to be over 18 they have to have a disability they have to you know meet that you know that two thousand dollar asset limit so it sounds a lot like exactly how we apply for medicaid and exactly the rules we use for social security so that's why if your loved one can qualify for medicaid or social security they're more than likely to qualify for the SLS waiver. Um, again, what you're doing is you're applying to the community center board, saying, hey, call them up. I have a center daughter that's about to turn 18. Um, if you're already connected to one, they should be reaching out to you roughly anywhere from 60 to, 60 to 90 to six months in advance, depending, um, 60 or 90 days, depending on your CCB. Each one operates a little differently. Um, some do it where they reach out six months in advance and slowly get everything together. Some do it in that 90 day period. They kind of want to get everything and do it all at once. Um, some might be ha have a backlog because, you know, everyone in the Montrose randomly, the disability, there's 20 or 30 of them turning 18, um, you know, are turning eight, yeah, 18 in September. So, you know, that's a big push for them, you know, where the other months they might only have two or three people turning that way. So, they should be reaching out to you if you're already connected with them. If you're already receiving CES services through the community center board or what we call uh, family support or community outreach for some CCBs, um, essentially it's, it's funding like once a month or funding that you request from them to pay for camps or different technology devices or, you know, different in-home swings or therapy blankets. If you're already having that connection with the community center board, you're in their database, you're in their roll call. So they should be reaching out to you um, based on their system of when your kiddo's about to turn 18. If, you if you're not connected, you know, um, and you need that contact for who your community center board is, reach out to me, I can give that to you. Um, but, uh, or if you are connected and you're, you haven't heard anything from them in a while, it's a good chance to reach out to them again and just make sure you're still in the system, you're still, things are still active, Things are still current. These are the services that you can, your loved one can get under that DD waiver, uh, not under, the, under the SLS waiver. There's a lot of them here. Um, I kind of explain the SLS waiver like a salad bar. Um, you get a plate. The size of your plate is based on your son or daughter's cyst level. This, this is a very long um, training that our you know assessment they go through. So they talk about everything from can they use a spoon, can they pick the spoon up from the bowl to their mouth. Um, it's a it's a whole nother training on, you know, when you do your cysts, you need to pretend like you're you've disappeared. Like you disappeared from the earth and they are by themselves. Like what can they do by themselves? So that relates back to that first class again of you writing down the things you as mom and dad or grandma, grandpa, uncle, aunt, caregiver are doing every day to get them through their day. Those things that if you weren't there, they would never change their clothes. They would never do the laundry. They would only eat, you know, whatever's packaged food because they don't know how to cook. Um, those are all those things that you need to be able to tell them because that's going to give them their cyst level. That's cyst level one through six, um, gives them a budget. In the SLS waiver, the budget matters. That's the size of your uh, salad bar plate. 
how you build your salad with your loved one is based on your loved one's needs. So services like Homemaker Basic and Enhanced, they, it sounds like they come out and clean your home. They clean the living spaces that your loved one uses. So um, that doesn't mean they're making your bed, doesn't mean they're cleaning your, bath, your bathroom, um, but if your loved one uses your room to watch TV and all day long, um, or to do their, their class, their kind of Zoom stuff right now with their day program, uh, then that's a living space for them. They can do some basic house cleaning around the kitchen, bathroom, sweeping, mopping. Um, the enhanced is really dealing with bodily fluids. So if your loved one has some issues with bodily fluids, if they're wearing adult diapers um, or adult you know, undergarments and there's any issue there, or your loved one has a very weakened immune system and needs things to be highly, highly cleaned um, because of that you know, immune system, or um, they have things like pica, Enhanced Homemaker would come in and they do a little bit more robust cleaning. Also Enhanced Homemaker does uh, a great service of, they can teach your loved one homemaking skills. One-on-one, um, -on -one, hand over hand support to get them um, into how to cook for themselves, how to clean for themselves, you know, how to do those household chores for themselves so it's not you or them. Um, that is a service that's provided. Um, supported Community Connections or, and Specialized Hab, those are day program. Those Supported Community Connections, or SCC as we call it, is out in the community. It's out in the, neighbor, you know, it's at, you know, a park, it's at, you know, volunteering at, at an art thrift store, it's going bowling, it's going to the, you know, grocery store, it's, you know, it's all these things that as a group, they're, they're going out in groups. Um, right now with COVID, that is a little bit of a, you know, hold up because um, we're not doing anything in groups, but they're doing a lot over Zoom. They're doing a lot of stuff in parks where they can be socially distanced, um, but that is day program. The specialized hab is on site. So that's when we have a facility. So they go to a, a, you know, a location. A lot of agencies use a little bit of both. They kind of make, make up their puzzle out of the day um, because they go to the base site to start the day for like half an hour where everyone sh shows up. Then they go out in the community and then they come back and everyone leaves for the day. Um, respite, respite is the only service in the plan and the adult system for you as a caregiver. It's for you to have a break. Um, so the primary caregiver can get respite. So someone comes in, there's essentially four different kinds of respite. The number one is individual respite where it's one-on-one -on -one and it's built in 15 minute increments. That's for you to go to the grocery store. That's for you to, you know, take a break and go out back and read. It's, a, it's for, you know, time for you to take care of your other children or other loved ones, you know, help them with their homework or whatever that looks like. And you have somebody else there to support your loved one with a disability and it's not just you. Um, respite doesn't mean you have to leave the home and it doesn't mean they have to leave the home. It means someone else is taking care of them and being supervising and supporting them while you're doing things. Some families use respite to go grocery shopping. Like, their loved one needs to go with them. They can't have, you know, them putting all this random stuff in the cart. So the respite provider's there to help support the lo their loved one while you're shopping um, or you're cooking a meal or things like that. Respite's also, so you can have a date night. You can have a, a weekend break. You can go to a wedding or, you know, a party or some celebration for a weekend and your loved one doesn't want to go with you because they're adults. I don't want to go with my parents to a wedding. Um, so that is your loved one doesn't have to either that they can stay home and have someone stay in your home and care for them, or they can go stay with someone else and care for them. Or that respite person comes with you to that event and cares for them. So you can get, you know, some time at the event and be around, the, you know, without having to be primary caregiver. It's a break for you. Um, personal care, once they're over the age of 21, that's someone that comes in and helps them bathe, toilet, eat, dress, all the stuff you've been doing for 21 years now. Um, we can pay someone else to come in and do. Um, typically, um, agencies like to bundle homemaker, respite, and personal care together because um, it's really hard to have someone come out and work for you for an hour. Um, Douglas County is a really big county. Arapahoe County is a really wide county. Um, it's really hard to send someone to Larkspur for an hour. Um, but hey, if they go down there and do some homemaker and they spend, you know, two hours with respite and then they and then they get them their evening bath ready, 
that's a four hour shift or a five hour shift, whatever it looks like, we can hire someone to do that. Support employment, that is getting them a job. It's someone to help them find a job, apply for a job. The only thing they can't do is literally be in the interview with them. Then they're there on the job. They're there teaching them every step of the job all the way through it, be it, you know, they're working the whole shift with them or they're working 15 minutes every two weeks or every month. Support employment is supposed to fade down as they learn their job. If that something changes, a supervisor changes their job, now they want to be a cashier instead of just, you know, a stalker, great. That support employment can go back up. Um, pre book services is, is pretty much going away. It's kind of to teach people how to have a job. It's not necessarily, we'd rather have people just have a job and teach them on the job. Mentorship is helping them be their own advocate, um, teaching them how to balance their own checkbook, how to, you know, budget their money, how to plan a meal for the meat meals for the week, how to use their own voice. Um, Non-medical transportation is we pay for all these things that for them to do. We got to get them there. Um, so we can pay to get them to support employment. We can pay to get them to their job. If they're, you know, do, we can pay to get them to their day program. Behavioral services are exactly what they sound like. Professional services are the hippo movement massage. Um, so hippos, uh, horse therapy, essentially. It's not equestrian therapy, but it's, um, hippo therapy is probably the coolest service. I always highlight it because it, the um, horse um, has a natural gait um, as any five foot 10 adult. Um, so they take the same step length on a, on a walking pace as a, a five foot 10 adult does. Their hips are placed in an upright position. So their hip movements are the same um, or pretty mimic um, adult you know, movement or human movement to their hips. So they can help with movement issues. They can help teach you know, some balance issues. Um, they're sensory too. That's also part of that of, you know, it doesn't mean they're just riding the horse. It could be they're grooming the horse. They're caring for it. There's a lot of parts to hippotherapy that's not just being on a horse. Um, there's movement therapy, which is music therapy. I've seen them play music with them, teach them music. I've walked in on mu movement therapy where they're just laying on the ground humming. Movement therapy is like the hippiest therapy, but it's great if your loved one needs it. Um, it's actually one that does really well in the pandemic because we can do movement therapy over Zoom and still get a lot out of it. Massage is just what it is. They can have massages in your home like once or twice a week where someone comes out or once or twice a month, um, typically, where someone comes out and actually gives them a massage. I ran a service plan during a massage session because that's when it was and the massage therapist was there. Um, home modifications, vehicle modifications, assistive technology, that's a different pot of money um, at the salad bar. Um, We'll go over in a second, adaptive rec, they can pay for a rec center pass. If they're there working with a um, PT or OT, uh, which most rec centers have, so you just have to do a little bit of homework for that one. There's the basic vision and dental, they get to see a doctor for their glasses or eyes. They get dental like everybody else does. Specialized medical equipment, so paying for things like wipes and catheters and different things that Medicaid will only pay for 10 a year the waiver can pick up the, what if they need more than that because of their disability. Um, a personal emergency response system, I fall and I can't get up button is what I call it. And then there's CDOS. CDOS is Consumer Directed Attendance Support Services. What it does is it waives the Nurse Practice Act so we can get you or somebody else to be paid to be to do the skilled level of care, nursing level, trachs, cathetering, um, suctioning, movement, things are, that a nurse or CNA level has to do we can do. There's a whole video on CDOS um, on our YouTube channel. Um, it's me talking about CDOS and how it works and how you apply it for CDOS in the SLS waiver. So the idea is that this is a salad bar. So you can build your salad as much as it will hold on your plate. The CIS levels run from like 12,000 roughly. Again, don't quote me on all the numbers. They're always shifting up a little bit. But 12,000 a year to you know, roughly around on thirty-four thousand dollars a year, depending on what CIS level you are, one through six. So if you're a CIS level three, you've got quite a big plate of around, you know, twenty-one thousand dollars. But day program might take up a lot of that plate. That's like the lettuce. There's a lot of it, and it's relatively cheap. Um, behavior services, those are like the croutons. They're really expensive, and there's not a lot of them. So you can dump the whole thing of croutons on your plate but you might not have a lot of more money left to spend for the, you know, on the rest of your plate. Um, some of these services like the home mods and vision and dental 
are like the soup at the end of a salad bar. You don't put them on your plate. They go in their own special bowl. So they have their own funding source. Um, but you get to rearrange that plate with your loved one, how they need it and how they want their services handled at any given time. So if you don't like how you built your plate, they can go back and rearrange that plate, you know, with their case manager and, and get and change services. Um, you can read this as all about CDOS. I used to do the CDOS training in this training, um, but CDOS is a very long, complicated system um, to explain. It's simple to use, but not easy to explain like everything is in the waiver programs. Um, so you can read through this. You can watch that video that we um, that's posted on our YouTube page that goes over CDOS. So I'll kind of click through here quickly. Questions on the SLS waiver? Either unmute yourself or throw it in the chat. The SLS waiver is again, where probably 90% of you are all going to start your waiver, your adult waiver services. Um, because there's a wait list, you get, you get to have that right away. Um, as long as they qualify, so they have Medicaid, they're at the party, then we can do the paperwork to see if they qualify to go down to the, the, the rec room in the basement. Um, that's what we, the SLS waiver is. The DD waiver, or the Development, Developmental Disabilities, or COMP waiver, or Residential waiver, we've all, everyone will call it something different, sorry. Um, this is the one with the wait list. It has roughly about 3,000 people on a wait list waiting for services. Um, luckily, here in the state of Colorado, uh, we're waiting for services, yes, but um, everyone's eligible to be on the EBD waiver or on the SLS waiver. So they're still getting something while they're waiting for the residential waiver. Um, so other states, uh, they have like Texas has 200,000 people waiting for services, meaning they're only getting Medicaid, they're not getting anything else. So at least we're giving, we have something. Now it's not, not for everyone. The SLS waiver isn't great. Sometimes it has a lot of limitations for individuals that have a lot of supports and needs and SLS just can't, can't afford to pay them, give them a bigger plate of the salad bar. That's where the DD waiver comes in. The DD waiver has almost all the same criteria as the SLS waiver. That's why if you're eligible for the SLS waiver, you're kind of just put on the wait list for the DD waiver because um, I kind of know you want to be on that list. And we'll go over the wait list in a moment. Um, so you have to be at a level of, you know, institutional level of care. You got to be over 18. You know, you need more supports and supervision. Um, currently, that's not really because, you know, an option because there's no open enrollment to the, um, the there's no open enrollment to the DD waiver. Um, so currently, that's kind of where you sit. Unless you're currently on the CES waiver, if you're currently getting CES and you maintain that till they're 18, they need the CES waiver. At 18, you can have the option to choose what waiver you wanna go into. Um, we recommend families choose the DD waiver because um, you can always go back. You can always go down to the SLS waiver. You can't go the other way because you're, you're waiting for forever, you're for a long, long time for that DD waiver. So if you have CES and you want to know more about that, please reach out to me and I can go over that, you know, a little more one-on-one -on -one with you all. Um, I will get into the system just a moment again. Let me, so these are the services in the comp waiver or the DD waiver. Um, there's a lot less of them. Um, I kind of use the analogy of, this is like the old school cafeteria tray that everyone gets, uh, you know, peas, everyone gets pudding, everyone gets the slice of pizza. Um, yes, Laurel, if you're on the CES waiver, you bypass the wait list and can option into the DD waiver if your loved one qualifies for CES. Um, so this is that old school cafeteria tray. The pizza is residential. Everyone gets it. Everyone gets 365 days of residential services. Again, they pay their own room and board. This is supervision and support. Um, it doesn't mean they have to live in a group home. doesn't mean they have to live in a host home. It could be in your home. We call that the family caregiver option. Um, we'll go over kind of where they can live. Um, that's the last two weeks of the, this presentation. Um, so we won't get into where and how they live in these waivers. These are just explaining the waivers. But they have day program, on, you know, on-site and off-site. They have support and employment again. They have transportation. They have vision. 
um, they got they get rid of a lot of the fr the, the specialty ones. So there is no hip hop therapy or movement therapy. Um, there is no home modifications. There is no adaptive rec. There is no respite because that's all in the the words of the state built in to that residential price point that they're paying someone to provide those level that level of supervision and support. They're paying them to do personal care. They're paying them to be their mentor by paying them for the residential rate. So this is the same, so like this waiver, there is no budget because it doesn't matter how, what CIS level you are, what matters is you, you're in the DD waiver because everyone gets the, the behavioral services or the peas on the cafeteria tray. Everyone gets the slice of pizza, everyone gets the pudding. And if you don't eat any of those peas because your loved one doesn't need it, then that's fine. It just sits there in the end of the year they recycle those peas and, and put them back in the next year. You get your tray and here's all your peas. You're putting your slice of pizza again. So unlike the SLS waiver where you are really kind of figuring out how you want to spend money and how you build your salad, the DD waivers, here you go. Here's what you get. Um, now there are some rules in the DD waiver of there's limitations to services. Like you only get 366 or 65, depending on if it's a leap year like this year is. Um, of residential supports. They only get four days, six hours a day of day program because that's what, what the waiver says is the limit. Um, so there are some limitations to the DD waiver in terms of how much services you get. Um, but for the most part, that residential level of care is really what it's built for. So the, the two of them, you know, both have the same financial requirements have the same targeting criteria for disability, both have that need to be that IC effort being put into an institutional level of care. Um, the notable differences is SLS, the targeting individuals, yeah, they should have somewhat some independence skills. Um, sadly, right now, because of the wait list, it doesn't lose, these two things don't really work that well. This is was when there wasn't a wait list, like you could choose which waiver you wanted to go on to. Um, right now, everyone's going on to SLS unless you're, again, you're in that CES or you're in emergency, um, which we, we go over in that living situation one at the end here. So stop and really think about um, the waivers for your loved ones. Um, if they qualify again for SLS, they qualify for the DD waiver. You don't have to do a separate intake. You don't have to be like, well, I want to do both. Nope, you're just trying to get into the waiver. You're trying to get into the basement. Once you're in the basement, then they'll give you what waiver you're on. Again, 90 probably 99% of you are gonna go on the SLS waiver to start. You know, again, comparing and contrasting, both waivers have day program, both waivers have support and deployment. Um, we want your loved ones to work. Um, so the rate for services will differ depending on their CIS score. Again, your CIS is a very support intensity scale, very long um, for any families that have already done it. Um, very long, it's even longer over Zoom I've heard. Um, assessment of everything in their life. And you really need to explain your son or daughter's needs, like you disappear. So when the provider, when the interviewer says, can they do their own laundry? Yeah, Bob can do his own laundry because his mom sets the washing machine. And, but he's never gonna be able to do it, but, you know, his mom didn't set the machine if she disappeared. So it's looking at those kind of things. Um, the big notable differences is, you know, some families really uh, need some homemaker supports. They need that personal care. They need maybe some home health supports. You don't get those in the DD waiver um, because it's built into that residential support level, uh, unfortunately. CDOS is also not available in the DD waiver, meaning uh, you have to have a nurse do anything or a CNA level of care, do anything that's health related, like, so, like what we call skilled care. So um, some families need that CDOS level of SLS, and so they stay in the SLS waiver because they really want that level of care. Um, so the funding, so that's, again, we talked already about the support intensity scale. That this scale is, um, we'll go over the years on the wait list in a moment. And um, again, we'll go over providers um, on a, in a moment too. So that this scale, um, really gives them, it's evidence-based, it's used by a lot of states. The state of Colorado is moving away from it. 
we will have a new assessment tool, which will be much better than the SIS. The SIS does have some flaws. It does put people into buckets. We don't really need people in buckets. We need people on a sliding scale of, you know, your level of needs are different than one level one's level of needs might be different than a different than another level one. Um, you can have your SIS redone. Um, you can have it redone as many times as you really want to. If, if there's a life change, a significant life change, I mean, they are, they're, they're, abilities are declining. Your abilities have declined, so you can't care for them the same way. There's a living situation, there's a death in the family, or whatever that might be, there's a living, there's a life change, like you would if you're, you know, doing anything with your health insurance. A significant life change, you can change your health insurance at any time. Same with this. But this evaluations can raise your score, but also can lower your score. So say your son or daughter is a three, when they come back and they do their shifts, they can come back as a two. And you can't go, oh, 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 never mind, we don't want that. Sorry, we're stuck at a two until we redo it again. Um, also, we don't know where they are on it. They could be a two, they could be a 2.1, a 2.4, a 2.6. We don't know how close they are to the next level. You just get a single number, you get a two or, or a three or a six. Um, so we don't know where they are. Also, the more needs your loved ones have, the more expensive it is to serve them. So serving a level one, a day program, or support employment is like four bucks every 15 minutes. Not too cheap. Um, but a level six is like $4.87. Doesn't sound like a lot of money. It's 87 cents. But it's 87 cents for every 15 minutes for however many hours that program, for however many weeks. So that 87 cents can be $10,000 more, which you might not have that money. So going up an assist level doesn't always mean more services. It means they need more level of support. Um, the, in the SLS waiver, we have what's called the service plan authorization limit or the fall. Um, that is the size, that is your uh, salad bar plate. The size of your plate is your small. If you're one, it's about $18,000 or $12,000. If you're a five, it's you know, 25, 26,000 roughly, somewhere in there, I think. Um, but that's what a SPAL is. And so you get to you know, kind of work that budget. There is no SPAL in the DD waiver. I mean, there's a spending limit. There's, we know how much we spend on people. But again, everyone gets the same tray of food. Everyone gets the same level of services. It just depends on when the DD waiver now, how much we're paying providers to provide those services. Yes, providers, multiple providers provide both services for SLS and DD. Obviously, no provider is going to give residential supports to an SLS individual because it's not in the waiver. But at day programs, there are individuals that are in the residential waiver, there are group homes, host homes, living with their parents in the residential waiver, and people that are on the SLS waiver. And it's not like they walk around and they get different level or services or some get to go bowling and others don't. It's the same waiver. It's just, there's the same level of support. It's the same day programs, same staffing, same direct care staff. Um, so on that, that fall kind of continued is it's based on that SIS level. So if you're a one, that's your, you get what pays for a one. CDOS partly uses your spall, but partly doesn't. Again, it's like, and it's like the crackers at a salad bar. You can put a bunch of them in your pocket and be fine. That's kind of how CDOS works um, in the SLS waiver. Um, and again, like I talked about, um, some services in SLS have a hard cap. Like, you know, we can have $1,000 of rec fees maybe a month, a year. And so it might be the teas in the salad bar. There's cheese there, but there's only so much. You can dump the whole thing on there, but then you're out of cheese. So in, in the comp waiver, um, there is no budget. So in the SLS waiver, you, you are kind of doing this. What's more important? Is day program or support employment more important? Or is behavioral services? Or is personal care and respite? So it's kind of a give and take. And you're always kind of balancing that out and changing that based on your loved one's needs. Um, that changes from you know week to week to year to year to maybe. Um, there is not one and the, there's not that level of need in the DD waiver. Um, so, and on, you can have home health. So if, if your loved one needs 
like a CNA level of care, they have a trach, they need suctioning, they have, you know, catheter or um, other, you know, gastro, you know, G tubes. You can have a CNA come in, you get home health in the home on top of the SLS waiver. So you have the SLS waiver doing day program, doing, you know, some ba basic bathing or toileting and a skilled nurse coming in to do everything else. In the DD waiver, all that's part of the DD waiver. Um, so the, like the DD waiver, there are no overall caps for funding. So there's no real fall per se. Um, there's funding limits based on services, like we talked about a little bit. Um, there's less options. They kind of take away some of the, the, the funner, more, that's all word loop, more fun, different waivers. Um, uh, because they're all, quote, incorporated into that residential rate. So you're supposed to be teaching them, you know, doing their personal care. You're supposed to, you know, figure out how to do respite on, you know, with a provider. So under that residential rate. So the wait list. Um, there is no wait list for SLS. Currently, we're still funded by the state. Um, the state could always adjust that. Um, Hopefully they will not with all the COVID budget crunch, crunches. We will work really hard at the ARCs to try and persuade that not to happen. We don't foresee that happening, but it's always something the state could come back and say, the SLS waiver has to go back on a wait list. It was on a wait list years ago where most families were waiting till about their loved ones were about 23, 24 before they were getting SLS services. Um, it hasn't had a wait list for over 10 years now plus. Um, so, but it is not always guaranteed forever. The DD waiver, yes, there's a current, currently there's no open waiver slot. So you can't just walk in and say, I want the DD waiver. Um, exceptions are made for what we call emergency requests, um, that they're homeless, they're at risk of seriously hurting themselves or others, they're in a neglectful, abuseful situation, um, that those idea of neglect is a very sensitive topic with parents. It doesn't mean you're mistreating your loved one. It might mean you have to carry them and lift them in and out of the bathroom, out of the bathtub. You can't do that when you're 65 and they're, you know, a buck 80 and they're, you know, 35. Like you can't do some of these things. So neglect might be that you just can't care for them the way they need to be cared for doesn't mean you're a bad parent or you're a bad loved one or you're you know, a bad caregiver. It just means we know that there's limitations to everyone. Um, again, in the CES waiver and CHIRP, if you're on CHIRP, but that one's a little less likely for most of you. Um, if you have it till you're 18, you can choose. Um, and again, we highly suggest going into the DD waiver because you can always go, we don't like this. Whoa, there's way too many rules. And we'll go over the rules in, the, in the, one of the final sessions of the DD waiver if they're living with you. But you can always go open and roll into that SLS waiver. So we, we would highly suggest if you're given the option of the DD waiver to take it. Um, so connecting the dots, really kind of looking at what they can and can't accomplish, what services they do need or get. Can they be left alone at home? These are all things that you need to know for not only what services you're looking for in the waiver per se, but also how you're answering that SIS. Um, most CCBs will do that upon the intake. So they'll do an intake, see if you're eligible to do it. Then they'll move on to a SIS to get you, your loved one a score. Once they have that SIS score, then they'll do a service, well, they'll, they'll do a 100.2 assessment. That is just another assessment to say, yep, they qualify for services. It's a pretty easy assessment. Then they'll do, a service plan to get your son or daughter actual help them find providers and start getting services. Um, again, we have uh, a completely other set of videos. It's three of them that talk about CDOS or consumer direct attendant support um, and services. I forgot the services there. Family caregivers. So that's if they live in your home or you're, you're a paid family member to provide some services. Family-owned PASAs, we'll talk a little bit about on the residential side. Um, so that is the kind of basics of the waivers. I am 